Hello everybody, thank you for joining us for another story time this week. This week our story is going to be about an insect that we probably haven't seen in a long time. If you're here in the Driftless region or if you're up near Pine River in Minnesota, um, you probably saw this insect for the last time, maybe last September, and then it just kind of disappeared. And here in a few weeks, uh, it's going to start reappearing. Okay. So today we're going to learn about where that insect went. But can you guess what insect I'm talking about that would disappear in the fall and return in the spring? It is a flying insect. It has wings. They are orange and black. And if you guessed a monarch butterfly, you are correct. My question for you is where do these insects go during the winter? How come they disappear? If you said they go to Mexico, then again, you are correct. We read a book earlier this year about where insects go in winter or what insects are doing in winter. Most of our insects don't migrate. That's a really long way to go for a teeny tiny little insect, or I guess teeny tiny if you're a monarch. Um, green darner dragonflies also migrate down to Texas, but most of our insects stay right here. They survive in different ways. Some might survive as eggs, like grasshopper eggs in the ground in the soil. Some might survive as in different life stages, like the, the larva or the caterpillar for our moths and butterflies, or moths and butterflies might survive in their cocoons or their chrysalis over the winter. Some might survive as adults, like our honeybees in their hive together. Um, our dragonflies, damselflies, mosquitoes, other insects like that actually overwinter in the water under the ice. So depending on the insect, they have different strategies for surviving the winter. So today's story is going to be about the monarchs and their journey down to Mexico and how people discovered that this was going on. Some of you might have learned in school that they go down to Mexico, but you probably didn't learn how we discovered that that's where they go. So our story today is called Winged Wonders, Solving the Monarch Migration Mystery. It was written by Meeg Pincus and illustrated by Yaz Imamura. For centuries, up and down North America, every year brought a mystery. Monarch butterflies swooped in for a spell, like clockwork, from somewhere beyond, and disappeared as curiously as they came. Where do they go? People pondered from southern Canada, through the middle of the United States, and all the way to central Mexico. So people in all those places saw monarchs coming through and were wondering, where are they going to? In 1976, the world finally learned the answer with a groundbreaking discovery, a one-of-a-kind insect journey, a remote roosting place, a small speck on the map, where millions of monarchs are drawn like magnets every winter. So you might think those are leaves, but if you look close, they're the monarchs in their winter roots. The Great Monarch Migration, the news stories called it. So who solved this age-old mystery? Who tracked these winged wonders from one end of the continent to the other? Who found their secret roosting place? A marvel of nature? Hmm, any guesses as to who solved this mystery? Maybe some clues here. Was it Fred, the Canadian scientist, who spent 30 years studying the monarch mystery from his university lab? who drove through the United States with Nora, his research partner wife, like detectives trying to track these cagey creatures' migration from Canada southward, who tagged Marnock's fragile wings, first with paint that faded, then with labels that plopped onto the ground when wet, and finally with price tags that stuck. So Fred the scientist, who was trying to label these monarchs, had to try a few different things before he found something that worked. 
And that's often what scientists have to do, right? Maybe their first idea doesn't work out and they have to try again. <clears throat> Was it Nora, master organizer of the monarch material they collected, who placed ads in newspapers near and far, seeking ordinary people to help by tagging monarchs' wings in their hometowns? Who wrote newsletters and kept in touch with all those volunteers? Who logged and mapped every tidbit of information they sent into the lab? would be a lot of work keeping track of all that data. You can see her putting it on the map. Was it those dozens, then hundreds, then thousands of science teachers, backyard gardeners, and other curious souls who answered Nora's ads and became citizen scientists who gently caught tagged and released the delicate dancing insects to help solve the migration mystery. So people just like you and me who are not professional scientists helped the scientists by collecting data and reporting it back to them. We call that citizen science or sometimes it's called community science because you don't have to be a citizen of any specific country to do this kind of science. So it's kind of, it's not the right name for it. So now it's being called community science. Was it Ken, the American adventurer, who spotted Nora's ad in a Mexico City newspaper while visiting there, who called her in Canada and agreed to follow the monarchs through Mexico, where he didn't speak the language, who bumped along winding roads with his newlywed wife, Catalina, for nearly two years, trying to track the butterfly's twisting trail. So here's Ken and Catalina chasing the monarchs. Was it the villagers and farmers of central Mexico who directed the couple to look higher, higher, up into the thin air of the volcanic mountains and their Oyamel tree groves? Who for generations welcomed the monarchs as soaring spirits during autumn Dia de los Muertos celebration, or the Day of the Dead, who held the whispered whereabouts of their winter roosting place? So these villagers welcomed these butterflies and thought of them as spirits as their ancestors and knew that they spent winter somewhere nearby this village and told them, go look up the mountain. Was it Catalina, born and raised in Mexico, who introduced Ken to her beloved monarchs, who spoke with the locals in her Spanish dialect to guide their search, who kept 40 notebooks of meticulous monarch data, who first crunched through early morning snow high in the Sierra Madre Mountains into an oil grove and exclaimed, I see them, I see them up here. Was it Jim, the American science teacher who with his students attached teeny tiny tags to tiny wings, who caught and tagged the very monarch in a Minnesota goldenrod field that Fred later found among millions in a Mexican oymel grove. An oymel is a kind of tree. Who gave Fred the proof he needed that one teeny tiny tag to announce the discovery of the great monarch migration. So those tags were really important. Otherwise, there would be no way of knowing that the monarch they saw in Minnesota was the same monarch that ended up down in Mexico months later. But because they put a tag on with a specific number, then when they found that monarch and realized it was the same number, they knew it had come all the way from Minnesota, which is pretty cool. Yes, the answer is yes. All of them, the scientists, all of them, the scientists, the citizen scientists, the regular folks along the way played a part in this discovery. Each person in small ways or large helped answer the centuries old question, where do they go? And now we know.
Each year, millions of monarchs fly the same path, generation after generation, from southern Canada through the United States to roost for the winter in central Mexico's mountains. Then they journey north again, feasting on milkweed plants along the way. However, today there's a new burning monarch question to be answered. How will they survive? Monarchs' numbers have plummeted since the 1976 discovery, from at least a billion down to millions, a handful now to each hundred then. Chemical sprays destroy their milkweed plants. Logging and farming threaten their oyamo groves. Pollution disrupts the air and weather for their flights. So they have a lot of threats now. So who can make a difference for monarchs today? Who can preserve their landing spots and airstreams? Who can keep them alive? The answer is actually no mystery at all. Who do you think could do those things? Oh, that's the end. You can do those things. And here's how. I'll read, I'm going to skip over this. It's more about the story of the discovery of the migration. But here's what you can do to help the monarchs. According to Monarch Watch, habitats for monarchs are declining at a rate of 6,000 acres a day in the United States. So what can we do to change that? Here are some ideas. Raise, tag, or report. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. Monarchs that you see as a citizen scientist. Live more lightly on Mother Earth. Use less plastic, electricity, water, chemicals, eat more plant-based local foods. Plant native milkweed with no chemical sprays wherever you live, from a small garden to a larger monarch way station. Fundraise, or, fundraise for or donate to a nonprofit organization that helps save the monarchs. Learn and educate others about the great monarch migration and how to conserve it. Which of these actions could you take with your family or your class? What part can you play in the continuing story of the magical monarchs? So the monarchs need our help and those are some ideas um, of how you can help. And they mentioned in there that you could report your monarch sightings. So there's a website called Journey North and I'll show it to you here right now where you can log your monarch sightings. And they have different categories for whether you saw the monarch as an adult butterfly that was flying. Maybe you found a monarch caterpillar on some leaves. Maybe you even found some monarch eggs. So there's different places where you can log those and I'll show you that. All right, so this is the Journey North website that you can go to. Um, if you, you can track lots of things on this website or learn about lots of different things in the Northwoods on this website, but I'm gonna click on monarch butterflies. Um, and then if you want to, it gives you a little update about the spring migration. You can report your sightings here, um, or you can see the migration map here, which is super cool. They have migration maps for lots of different things, but I'm gonna go down to the first adult monarch sighting. So the first monarch I see of the year, I would report it here, but you can also see um, a map here, it's loading a little funny, give it a minute, here we go, but I can click on this timeline, if I drag it back all the way back to January and February, you see just maybe a few sightings in the south, but they're down here in central Mexico. And if I hit play, it's going to move from January of 2021, so this year, all the way until the date today, which is May 19th. So let's go ahead and play and see the monarchs migrate. So more sightings start in the south, and then they slowly start to go north. You can see two different populations here. We have the eastern populations of monarchs. These are the monarchs that we see. We'll look for sightings in Minnesota. Yay! Um, and these overwinter in central Mexico. There's also a Western population of monarchs that kind of hang out in California, but um, all of our monarchs migrate all the way down here to Mexico and it takes multiple generations. So 
the monarchs that flew down to Mexico last September maybe fly back up to Texas and then the adults are going to stop and lay eggs in Texas. Those eggs are going to hatch, they're going to turn into adults, maybe they fly up to Kansas or Nebraska and they're going to stop and lay eggs. Right? Those eggs are going to hatch and they're going to turn into adults and then those adults are going to start coming up. So it can take two or three, maybe even four generations of monarchs to make it back up to Minnesota or Wisconsin which is why it can take a little longer to migrate up. But you can watch that on the map here. You can click here to report your sighting. Let me go back to the other page for a minute. So you can also, if you want to help monarchs, you could monitor quite a few different things. You could monitor milkweed. You could look for monarch eggs or monarch caterpillars or raise your own monarchs and um, you can observe the monarchs that you rear and then record where you're letting them go. So lots of different options. This is a super fun website with lots of great resources. Check it out. So that was Journey North. There's also other websites um, like Monarch Watch, where if you find a tagged monarch butterfly, you can report that sighting and the number that you find on that monarch. There's the Monarch um, larva monitoring project so if you have a patch of milkweed in your yard you could monitor it for monarch caterpillars it's kind of a tongue twister so anytime you find a caterpillar in there you could report it to that website um, there's a bunch of great websites out there for monarchs monarch joint venture is another really good one for resources or if you want to learn more they kind of help organize all the different organizations and make sure everybody's talking to one another but they have a lot of great um things on their website as well. So I'll put all those resources into our resource and activity list for today. But thank you for coming to Storytime this week. I hope that you get outside and start looking for monarchs. Maybe you're gonna go plant some milkweed now so that you can draw monarchs into your yard and provide that really important habitat for them so we can help them survive into the future. I'll see you back next week for a story time from last summer and then in two weeks for a brand new story time. I'll see you later, bye.